And, uh, again, my name is Hank Shea. I'm a fellow here. Uh, in my prior life, I was a federal prosecutor here in Minnesota. And uh, for 20 years, I prosecuted mostly white collar offenders. Uh, no elected officials. I supervised cases where elected officials were prosecuted, but I didn't handle any of those cases myself. I am, uh, I am joined today by Doug Kelly, and uh, those in Minnesota, I'm sure, recognize his name, but for those who, uh, who do not know Doug, he is one of the most widely respected <coughs> trial lawyers in the state of Minnesota. He frequently has handled cases involving political aspects. He has successfully represented a number of elected officials and political figures in both state and federal investigations, and those are representations, for the most part, you never heard about. Now, he's also represented a number of people who were charged and went to trial. Uh, he vigorously represented those people, but was unsuccessful in their defense. And they included two former uh, state senators, as well as a former state representative. Those are cases that you heard and read a lot about. And we may refer to one or two of those today, although not by name. Um, suffice it to say that uh, no better uh, person could accompany me here today for what I think will be two different views of how and why elected officials get prosecuted. Doug has been an assistant U.S. attorney, same office that I served in in the 80s before I got there, successfully prosecuted a wide range of white collar crimes, including some organized crime cases, pretty unusual here for Minnesota. Uh, he was chief of staff to U.S. Senator Dave Dernberger in Washington, D.C. He was uh, the chair of the Minnesota Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board from 2000 to 2004. Most recently, we read about his work on a regular basis here. He's the receiver in the Tom Petters case, and so far he and his uh, fellow staff and lawyers have recovered hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for the victims of that multi-billion dollar Ponzi scheme case. So it's my pleasure to have Doug Kelly here today. We're going to just split this up, much like we do uh, two closing arguments, but the main uh, thing will be we're here for you. So we invite questions uh, throughout. I'm going to solicit your input. As I indicated uh, earlier, uh, I'm going to ask uh, everybody to raise their hand about certain elected officials' uh, punishments and to see where we all think the, the justice system should come down in terms of sanctioning conduct that's found to be illegal. I don't speak for the Department of Justice today. I don't speak for either of the universities where I teach at. I'm here for you, and I'm here to prompt you to understand how ethical misconduct can morph into criminal wrongdoing. Uh, I'm going to do this in six simple lessons. I have some final tips, but I think I'll save those for after Doug's, uh, Doug's talk, and then we'll get to uh, your questions, as I say, throughout. So let's just get to the six lessons right away. Uh, the first one hinted at this in my opening comments earlier, no one is invulnerable to temptation or weakness or immune from bad decisions and improper behavior. Uh, the examples I'm going to lay out here, I have drawn from around the country. They involve uh, leadership. They involve rank and file members. I have chosen an equal number of Democrats and Republicans. I have a few more men than women, but the bottom line which I'm trying to convey is this can happen anywhere to almost anybody. Most of the white collar offenders who I prosecuted, uh, they were several hundred in number during my career, did not wake up the day of their offense and say, today is the day I risk everything. Today is the day I risk my liberty, my reputation, my family's well-being. White collar crime typically does not happen that way. Bank robbers, drug dealers, they wake up, we know they're going to commit the crime. People who look like all of you and look like me and everybody in my neighborhood often start off with something minor, a transgression, a compromise. The situation doesn't go away. They do something again or worse. They cover it up and it snowballs. And ultimately, they're held to account. That's the lesson we want to impart, at least in part today, is that it's not thinking I'm risking it all by signing this form. It is I'm signing this form knowing that it's not accurate, knowing it's not complete. Lesson number two. 
most serious unethical conduct will come to light, often in ways you could never foresee. So when you are faced with some tough ethical choice or dilemma, you should assume whatever you decide will someday become public. I've done uh, presentations with over two dozen white collar offenders uh, around the country. One of them highlights this more than anything else. He was a state uh, representative in Missouri. He also was a senior assistant attorney general, had been a prosecutor. A friend decided to run for Congress. Long story short, he served as an advisor to this friend. They got an independent expenditure going, a lot of money actually. And as too often happens in campaigns, there was coordination the week before the election between the independent expenditure, got addresses from the office where the elected official was seating, to do a last mailing to all likely voters. The Federal Election Commission gets a complaint. They start an investigation. These two people get together with some of their staff and decide to cover up what at this point is a FEC violation, an administrative matter. They talk somebody into testifying falsely. The Federal Election Commission shuts everything down, says no violation. Two years go by. Both of these individuals get elected. One to the State House, one to the State Senate. The person they talked into lying had been wearing a tape recorder. On his own, he was tape recording conversations with whoever he talked to. And he got involved in a whole series of criminal matters. And they do a search warrant on his apartment, and they find hundreds of tapes. And the cops start listening to the tapes. And one of the cops says, I recognize that person. He's my representative. Two years later, they go to the FBI. The FBI comes calling. You can guess the outcome. Both end up with federal felony convictions. It turns out that the person who'd done the tape recording later gets convicted of planting a bomb in the car of who he believed to be his wife's divorce lawyer. And in fact, it was a different lawyer who got seriously injured in the case. You can't make this stuff up. Like Tom Little said, I mean, who would have ever thought? Who would have ever thought? I'm not going to identify people by name today. I'm not going to identify people by party. Because as you heard earlier, I think the reason we're doing this, it's not to cause you discomfort, though it might. It's not to scare you, though it might. But the reason we're doing this is as you hear these situations, and we pass judgment on these people after the fact, Ask yourself, could this happen to a colleague? Could this ever happen to me? Lesson number three. I think by far the things we'll talk about that turn into criminal conduct revolve around this lesson. Undisclosed financial conflicts of interest constitute huge risks and dangers, almost like wearing a target on your back. Let's start with case number one. State representative, former state representative, He's on the House Regulated Industries Committee in his state. He also has a partnership interest in two companies that are loaned about $670,000. Key fact is that to get that loan, the state representative personally guaranteed those loans. The company struggles, so the state representative goes to colleagues, sponsors legislation, and gets it passed to benefit the entire industry not just this company. No disclosure regarding the guaranteed loans. At this point, in very dangerous territory. I'm not saying it's a crime, but very dangerous territory. The state representative then approaches two utility companies to provide legislatively authorized funds to the recycling company without disclosing his guaranteed loans to the company. Over the course of several years, they provide $284,000 that goes to the recycling company that helps pays off the guaranteed loans. Again, no disclosure of any of this in any of the state's ethics forms. What result? Case goes to trial. Jury finds 
the defendant guilty of two counts of mail fraud, of deprivation of honest services, and also money laundering. You all are the judge. You have the opportunity to impose jail time, imprisonment, to impose financial sanctions. You have the authority to provide, impose both. How many people would impose prison time, that is more than 12 months in a jail situation for this type of offense? Anybody? How many would not impose any jail time? People are in between. How about financial sanctions? There's $284,000 here. Okay, that's, that's a much easier one. Well, in this case, the judge, under the authority uh, he had, imposed both a prison term and financial sanctions. 48 months imprisonment. And then he ordered the $284,000 to be provided back to the state by way of restitution. And then he ordered, in somewhat unusual circumstances, that an additional $284,000 be forfeited to the United States, because this was a federal prosecution. So the person ended up paying a double financial penalty. Let's turn to another one. This one I received quite a lot of press nationally, so maybe you've heard of it. State representative and former Speaker of the House. He started as an assistant district attorney. He then served 30 years in the state legislature, uh, accomplished quite a lot during that time, ultimately rose to the level of Speaker. He encountered greatly increased personal living expenses and less income from his law practice because he was devoting so much time out of session at the Capitol. Ultimately, he was charged with one specific crime, and that was taking a $65,000 referral fee from a former attorney, a young attorney, who had worked for him. And the government's allegation that this was a disguised kickback from a computer software company that was trying to obtain software consulting contracts with the state. The legislator denied it, went to trial, and the government called the state's governor and other state agency leaders to describe the pressures that the speaker had put on them to give consulting company business to the software firm. And then they also, at the end of the trial, called the young attorney, who described the $65,000 as something other than a referral fee. What result? The jury found him guilty of seven of the nine charges for de deprivation of honest services, mail fraud, and they also convicted him of extortion because of the way he had dealt with the public agency heads in trying to influence them in granting these contracts. $65,000 is what he received. How many of you would impose prison time for this? How many of you would impose a financial sanction of more than $65,000? Well, in this case, the judge imposed eight years of imprisonment in a federal institution, $65,000 of forfeiture. And to add to that, which often happens in these cases, he lost his government pension after 30 years of service, and then he was disbarred in 2014 and will never practice law again. Let's go to lesson number four. I have other cases, and if time permits, we can, we can share other examples, but this is one I think that's got some currency uh, uh, in, in this state as well as others. Beware of the relationships and the perils that arise from them with nonprofits. Um, nonprofits, by their very nature, not regulated very much, loosely organized and run, they're vulnerable to abuse uh, by people who are in positions of trust. And often, people who are in the legislature are serving their community in many different ways and get involved in nonprofits, whether it be on the boards or in some cases actually running those agencies. Let's talk about former state representative who had previously been a state senator. When that person was a state senator, he had also served as the executive director for a nonprofit charity organized solely to serve the poor. In the course of winding down this particular nonprofit, the senator sold its main asset, which was a building, and he used $144,000 of the proceeds for personal expenses. And as is often the case, he failed to report any of that income on his tax returns. What result? 
He ultimately pled guilty in federal court to wire fraud involving the $144,000 of funds and to tax evasion. How many people would impose imprisonment in a case like this? Okay. The judge agreed with you and imposed 27 months imprisonment. Here's another one that's, uh, there's several variations of this. I'll just give you one. A former state senator ran a nonprofit that received public funds to educate parents about the local public school system. She controlled the nonprofit's finances, had sole control. Obvious danger from the start. She got into financial difficulties, and she wrote checks to herself and to family members and made ATM withdrawals and ultimately ended up using some straw recipients to obtain monies from the nonprofit. Total was $87,000. Result, pled guilty to conspiracy to commit mail fraud pursuant to a plea agreement. But that's not the end of the story. What do you think the FBI did when she came in and confessed? What do you think they do in all cases like this? Do you know anybody else who's doing this? So she agreed to invite six other state senators and others to her home. They were secretly recorded by the FBI as part of the ongoing federal corruption investigation. Some of those cases are still being prosecuted now. But because of that, the government asked the court to give her a much more lenient sentence than she otherwise would have received. And how many of you, under these circumstances, would impose jail time for this person? Maybe even more than some we had before. <laughs> she got a year and a day in prison. And that was, as I said, below the guidelines that was called for in this particular offense. Lesson number five. I hope that these next two lessons are, are self-apparent to all of us, given what's gone on in recent and in not so recent times. Obstructing justice will get you prosecuted. The cover-up is often worse than the underlying crime. I mean, Watergate. Martha Stewart. How about the former New York State Senator, not too long ago, which disclosed a state, is investigated for seeking, in the government's eyes, demanding cash payments from an attorney that he was doing business with in regards to a nonprofit. The nonprofit needed state funds. This attorney uh, was the key for that nonprofit's lobbying on the Hill. And there was some money provided to the nonprofit. The senator met with this attorney after he found out he was in, under investigation, and he asked him to say, if ever asked by the investigators, that he had never taken any money during their relationship. Of course, the attorney had already been busted by the feds and was wearing a wire. And even though the senator received $43,000 in total payments during the course of the investigation, it was unclear that the government could ever prove that there had ever been extortion or demands or bribery. What result? He pleads guilty to obstructing a federal grand jury investigation and to filing a false income tax return. What punishment? How many of you would impose, impose a jail or prison term for this type of violation? A little bit fewer than before. Well, the court imposed a term of 21 months imprisonment and three years of supervised release. You know, one key thing about obstruction, you read about the FBI or DEA or others being obstructed, those are all very valid concerns. If anybody's trying to impose uh, or obstruct the federal law enforcement investigation, you can get involved in obstruction of justice even in a civil proceeding. If you were under oath, and many times legislators as well as other public officials are asked to be placed under oath, in testifying, you are potentially facing an obstruction of justice charge if you intentionally lie at that time. Here are the facts, and this is a, this is a very controversial case. Former Speaker of the House, who was also a lawyer, was called to testify in a civil case about alleged racial discrimination in the House's prior redistricting actions. He testified he was not involved in several key decisions that were alleged to have been racially discriminatory. Ultimately made its way to the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office. 
investigated and it was found that he lied. He had been involved and just didn't want others to know about it. What result? To avoid being charged with perjury and a higher <coughs> likelihood of a prison term, he pled guilty to obstruction of justice. How many of you would impose jail time in this situation? He's, he's admitted to lying, but that's all he's done in the civil case. Got no personal gain from it. Well, the government argued for jail time. The defense obviously opposed it. And the court decided that 18 months of unsupervised probation was the right sentence. $25,000 fine. But, as you might guess, 2010, he was disbarred by the state Supreme Court. 2012, the State Retirement Board took away his government pension after many years of government service. Finally, not surprising, lying to the FBI can get you prosecuted. Former Senator number one, this is taken from uh, recent news, uh, state senator had promised to steer business to a law firm if they would hire his son, a young lawyer. The firm hired his son, and in return for that, a lobbying group that the senator was strongly affiliated with provided the funds to the law firm to pay the senator's son's salary. FBI comes calling, asks him, do you know anything about this arrangement, about your son getting hired by this law firm and the lobbying firm providing the money to pay a salary? The senator says, had no knowledge. Well, the facts were otherwise. He was charged only with lying to the FBI. He was not charged with any type of bribery or deprivation of minor services. Went to trial, and on July 22nd, this summer, jury found him guilty of a false statement to the FBI, and under that state's laws, he was automatically expelled from the legislature, and he's now awaiting sentencing. And as you might guess, when these cases get rolling like this, they don't stop. The son has been charged, pled guilty, and now has been sentenced for tax fraud in connection with his not reporting all of the income that he received from the law firm. Lesson number six, newsflash. The federal government does not always get it right. But even if the Department of Justice loses all or most of the case, there are no winners for anybody involved. Here's a current state senator, received about $250,000 in what were described as community relations consulting payments from a grocery chain with stores in his district, done pursuant to a signed contract, and the senator declared every dollar on his tax returns as income. But he never disclosed this arrangement on the state's required ethics forms, the disclosure forms. The government's allegation was he received the money in exchange for favors and pointed to repeated undisclosed efforts uh, regarding the arrangement uh, at the legislature. Bottom line was the facts were very similar to the facts from the first case I told you about involving the senator with the regulated industries. The one difference was in this case the defendant's attorneys called many prominent witnesses from both parties, including seated elected officials, to testify on the behalf of the senator. And the brunt of their testimony was that he was a very good person who was very disorganized, who was very um, unattentive to detail and even forgetful, and he was not a deceitful person. Jury deliberated and acquitted him on all counts. One juror said after the trial, it was clearly unethical conduct, but we just didn't believe it had been proven to be criminal. And an interesting postscript to this, the Senate met shortly after the verdict, and they censured this senator for his conduct, and it was a unanimous vote. It was joined by the senator who had just been acquitted. Um, I'm mindful of our time, so I think I'm going to stop there. I have some final tips, and uh, if we have a chance, we'll come back to a few more cases. Doug Kelly. 
Well, good morning. I'm uh, happy to be here with you. Um, I've been involved in politics all of my life, from the time I was doing block work for my uh, local state senator while I was in college, right up through uh, um, a lot of things that where I've represented U.S. senators and congressmen and others now. Um, and I'm not here to give a, uh, a rebuttal to Hank's statement. Um, what I'm hoping to do is to give a little bit of an insider view about how some of these things um, happen in politics. Um, uh, you know, when I was a candidate, I ran for governor uh, way back in 1990, so I understand what the pushes and pulls are on you when you are a candidate for a statewide office or even for a uh, different office. And I, I just want to let you know, I admire what you all do. You are public servants. You give up a lot of stuff to do what you do. Um, politics aren't fun anymore the way they kind of used to be. It's gotcha politics and it's hardball. Um, and that affects how my talk to you this morning is about the different kind of atmosphere in which you find yourselves. One thing I can share with you that's different from Hank's perspective, and that is that if you as a public official come across a prosecutor's desk, you are not gonna be treated like every other citizen in the United States. You just need to know that. There is a double standard, um, and if people look at you and see cases that are <clears throat> on the edge, um, frequently because you are public servants, and, and it's a combination of a couple of things. One is a good policy, and the policy at the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Minnesota when I was there and after has been zero tolerance for public uh, misbehavior by officials. So even the smallest little bribes of six or seven thousand dollars to a city councilman will get you indicted in the federal system. Now that's fine, I understand that part, but the other part is you need to know so that it's some young prosecutor and <clears throat> he or she is trying to make a name for themselves, if you as a state legislator come across the transom, um, you are going to be a very attractive target for them. <clears throat> now, um, I'm not going to talk a lot about all the things that Hank talked, and here we are this morning, I see this is today's New York Times. Um, Ex-assemblyman scolded by judge and gets a 14-year term for corruption. Um, you know, stealing, you know, everybody knows that's easy. You don't steal, you don't do that, you don't take bribes. That's kind of, those are different. In the cases that Hank talked about, there is this slippery slope about that. So I didn't come here to say don't steal, don't take bribes. That's pretty obvious and you all will know that. What I would like to do today is to talk to you a little bit about some, when you see decisions being made that start you on that slippery road. Uh, people, how, how do good people get into gray areas and then somehow let things slide beyond them? And I'm going to pick a couple of examples. I'm going to actually use names because these were cases I was involved in. Um, but they are um, <clears throat> really old cases and everything I'm going to say is on the public record. Uh, and I've had a couple of aha moments that have landed me in some very interesting representation of officials. Um, Hank told you that I was the chief of staff for Senator Dave Nuremberger uh, during the 1980s when he was chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, a really big job um, in D.C. Bill Casey was the head of the CIA, and they didn't get along at all, and there was fighting going back and forth between them. One night I was asleep in my Great Falls home in Virginia and I got a telephone call from then little known Jerusalem Post reporter Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> and uh, he said, are you Doug Kelly? You know, it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm talking to him. I said, yes, I'm Doug Kelly, you're Senator Durenberger's chairman or chief of staff. Yes, I am. He said, did you know about your, your boss's comments at a fundraiser last night about convicted spy Jonathan Pollard? I said, no, I didn't. And so he said, well, um, it was at a fundraiser for the American Israel Political Action Committee. And um, Senator Durenberger, according to Blitzer, said, I don't see what the big deal is about Jonathan Pollard, who had just been given a 30-year sentence. Everyone knows we spy on the Jews, and the Jews spy on us, quote, unquote. <clears throat> um, so, and 
so uh, Wolf Blitzer says, do you have a comment about that? And I said, I'll have to get back to you. Um, and uh, so right afterwards, uh, you know, by that, that was, I think, on a Thursday night, by Sunday morning, Casper Weinberger, then Secretary of Defense, went on uh, the morning talk shows and said this was one of the greatest breaches of security by a public official for a long time. It really turned into a big deal. Um, I ended up representing Senator Durnberger with, along with a Washington, D.C. lawyer. Uh, we negotiated with then Senators Howell Heflin and Warren Rudman, uh, who were chair and vice chair of the Ethics Committee at the time, and Senator Durnberger was reproved by the U.S. Senate. That was my word. It wasn't censured, it was reproved. Had the same effect at any rate. Um, and uh, it was, it wasn't a criminal prosecution by any means, but it was a very big deal and a very big, important uh, event in Senator Durenberger's um, Senate life. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, let me tell you about one other aha moment. And this was when I was chairman of the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board here in Minnesota, appointed by Governor uh, Ventura. And when I took that job, <laughs> I really thought that I was going to end up um, having to arbitrate what was going on with fees and other things coming from the World Wrestling Federation or something like that. I, I really thought, I told the governor, I said at the time, I said, I'm going to call him like I see him. So I had gone to vacation um, and came back uh, from out west and I was watching uh, TV and saw a TV ad that appeared uh, on TV right after Labor Day. and it, featured then-candidate Tim Pawlenty um, talking directly to the camera, saying, hi, I'm Tim Pawlenty. This is where I went to school in South St. Paul. Uh, hi, I'm Tim Pawlenty. This is when I went to, uh, <clears throat> this is where I worked in the stockyards in South St. Paul, et cetera. And I thought, oh, that's a cute ad. That's good, good introduction. And then at the end, the disclaimer said, paid for by the Republican Party in Minnesota. And I commented to my friend at the time, I said, I wouldn't be surprised if we we're going to get a complaint. There was a complaint filed. And of course, the issue was whether or not the party and the candidate had coordinated uh, what they had done. Um, that led to a three-day closed hearing before the Campaign Finance Board. Um, ultimately, uh, they voted to fine um, candidate Palenti then $600,000 or really take it out of his budget um, for TV ads. His lawyers advised that he appeal that. Um, Tim Palenti overruled that, um, took responsibility for it. And in fact, once he took responsibility for it, his poll numbers went up and he went on to an election and served two terms as governor. Now, neither of these cases were criminal prosecutions, but each was really important to the candidates. And let me, the reason I wanted to bring them up, one involves kind of a casual off-end comment, and other one is a very complicated decision about how do you get TV ads on paper and how do you get in trouble for doing that. Now, as Hank said, people don't get up in the morning and say, I'm gonna violate the rules here or the law or the ethics. Um, you know, and when Senator Durenberger was chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, it's like walking a tightrope because half the time the stuff that you get briefed on by the staff is already in the New York Times. So how do you say it? What do you do? Um, and that's a very uh, important thing. But I think you all know that, and particularly, in, I heard the first speaker talking about all the stuff's going on with social media. The comments you make are extremely important. <clears throat> And these casual comments that come out sometimes can have just catastrophic effects for yourself. So when you're off at fundraisers and homes and suburbs or in northern Minnesota or wherever you may be, you know, the idea that you can make a casual offhand comment it's not going to come back um, really doesn't work anymore. Now let me talk a little bit too about the, uh, the campaign uh, uh, ads from Senator Pawlenty, or I mean Governor Pawlenty. You know, one of the things is that's kind of sad, I think, people sometimes over in St. Paul, when you get there, listen to what happens in the echo chamber so much that you start to believe what's going on. So unlike the, Senate, the, the offhand comment by Durenberger, you think about what it takes to get a TV ad up and running. So somebody had to talk about and vet, all right, 
let's see, I wonder how far we can go with the campaign laws and how far we can push whether or not there is a coordination between the party and the committee. Obviously, there were lawyers involved, there's a campaign manager involved, and you have this little echo chamber where people are saying, well, I don't see any reason why we can't do it. Now, if you think about the ads that you used to see, it's okay if you take a picture at a convention of somebody giving a speech and then the party uses that for that candidate. That's perfectly acceptable. In this one, though, it was Tim Plenty, obviously had hired a group and went around with the camera and did all those things. So you have a campaign manager who wants to win at all costs, and then they do something that um, I've seen so many times in political things, you shop for legal opinions. You go around, you talk to different people. You might get three no's, but then somebody says yes. So three red lights and a green light, what do you do? And when you make that decision, um, you, you need to know if you've got that kind of advice coming from different lawyers, um, there's something wrong, and if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. Um, and in that case, um, it was not ever, there was never any evidence that Tim Pawlenty himself uh, figured out these ads or did them, but ultimately when you look at it, you're the candidate and you see what's going to happen, you ought to know what your campaign manager's doing, and when you're running around doing these particular things, um, uh, you should say, if it doesn't feel right, I'm not going to do this, and I shouldn't coordinate with the party. So th those are a couple. Now, nobody went under oath at the beginning on Senator Durenberger's or the other one. There were no charges, but as Hank has said, frequently the cases that come to prosecution start off innocently enough with really small violations that would be a misdemeanor, an ethical violation, or something else, and then all of a sudden it snowballs and it turns into a federal felony. Little things really matter. How do you use state phones? I represented the Republican caucus way back many years ago in what was called phone gate. You might remember that people in the legislature were all using their state phones. A lot of people were using their state phones um, for personal calls. And uh, there were a couple who had really abused that privilege, but then it came out, oh my, um, almost everybody's doing it. And uh, that went into an investigation, and we managed to, um, to uh, negotiate a, a deal where people did not plead. Actually, I think there were two senators who, who uh, pled guilty uh, to that. But, you know, there's that inside echo chamber mentality. Oh, everybody's kind of doing that. Nobody's looking at it carefully. And that is what will get you in trouble. Today, computers are the same. And people will use their computers. You got to just draw a line. You don't use computers, state computers, for any of the campaign business or personal business. And let me get to the other one, which is the campaign reports and the disclosures um, that Hank talked so much about. And in that hypothetical case that Hank gave, I represented that hypothetical representative. Um, and uh, it was a case in which uh, the, the issue was financial disclosure. And everything Hank said um, was absolutely true uh, during that prosecution. And I think, I think Hank, it was like 27 count indictment and like 24 acquittals, but three counts which ended up in, in jail time for that person. Um, you should know that I put on testimony from the head of the, the executive director of the Campaign Finance Disclosure Board who said you did not need to disclose the item that the government was prosecuting this representative for. Said it's just not a needed a disclosure here. This is not um, a level of disclosure that is required. Also, it was said that it, under the state rules, since, it, since the legislation that was passed that benefited this one uh, it, company, but it benefited the entire industry, you didn't need to recuse yourself. So here's the person who's, you know, calling the balls and strikes for the state who said, you don't have to disclose and you don't have to recuse, and yet he ended up in jail um, for the non-disclosure. Um, and I argued, if you don't have to put it on the state form, where do you go to disclose it? Um, but nonetheless, um, that resulted in a conviction. Um, and so, you know, when you, whenever you're in doubt about those kind of things, make your own disclosures. 
Um, and as I said at the outset, if you come across the transom of a prosecutor, you will not get the benefit of the doubt. And I have watched and seen so many times where I've represented people um, who, when they come in front of a prosecutor, it's, it, you kind of lose your objectivity as a prosecutor sometimes and bend over backwards to do that. Um, so you, and, and I think as a criminal defense lawyer, one of the things that you have to realize right off the bat is when somebody comes knocking at your door uh, or if somebody, something happens that signals something's gone wrong, I, I know what happens. And what the trouble with, the, with people who are in office, you always think politically first and last about your legal rights. And that can have catastrophic effects. And even though uh, Hank said, you know, the cover up is worse, that's absolutely true. And I try to keep my clients from making statements, but frequently by the time they get to me, they've already made a whole bunch of public pronouncements about things. And you need to know that when you get to a trial, if you ever were ever going to have that happen, you might get out there and say, well, I, I've never said anything about this under oath. How can I uh, be a prosecutor whatsoever? But you need to know, you get on the witness stand and say something, and you say, I did not do this or I did not say this, and the next thing that'll pop up will be a, a clip of a TV program, a piece of uh, something off a radio program or a newspaper story uh, that will be used to impeach you and will cut out, um, to cut the credibility of you uh, tremendously. So, you know, and, and Hank mentioned uh, Martha Stewart as part of this. Uh, Martha Stewart, you know, she's not political, but she was looked at for um, her violations on insider trading, that kind of stuff. You know what, um, if she had just kept her mouth shut and not said anything, she never would have been prosecuted. But people, and particular people in politics, your first reaction is to react politically, make statements to the, to the media, and be recorded and do all those other things. And that's the worst statement because, um, you know, you need to take time and be careful. So those, those are some of the, some of the hints. Well, you know, I mean, that's, a, that's an important consideration, and everybody that I know says, I'll go to my press secretary and we'll figure out what we're going to say first, and then I'll call the lawyer later. All I'm saying is you, you would be better off if you ever have one of these things where you have an event that you think, all right, might, this might snowball and get worse, um, to go. And, and typically, the very first reaction is to deny everything, even if some of it is so painfully, apparently true um, that I see. And then when you have to have made the denials and you have all these public statements, then later on if you decide um, that you're going to take the witness stand or you're going to try to do something uh, uh, legally with that, you will have all those statements uh, thrown right in your face. And as I said, they will undercut your credibility. So it, it is hard. Um, but I, when the clients come in to talk to me, I say, let's make sure we have our priorities straight. I would think your number one priority would be stay out of jail. Oh yeah, I guess that's true. Yes, Doug, you got it. Number two, uh, you want to do, don't do anything that hurts your family. And number three, well, what about my office? Do I, what do I do with that? And to try to make sure that people uh, understand those choices that they have to make um, when they're defending. And, and as Hank said earlier, go out and get legal opinions quickly. You can get legal opinions on all these disclosure matters all that kind of stuff, and make sure it resonates with what you are thinking. You had a question. I think there's several lever, uh, ways to do it. One is, um, okay, I, I think the, uh, the question was, if I had recommended disclosure, if you think you're worried about whether you, need, you may need to make the disclosure or not, what do you do about that? Um, and if you go and make a disclosure which is not required, 
um, on the forum, isn't that just gonna make further inquiry? It probably will, but in this particular case, if the, 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 the hypothetical that we were talking about, if there had been a disclosure there, I think it would have cut the case off uh, entirely. Now, also as state legislators, I mean, you can make disclosures in a number of different ways. One is you can do it on the floor sometimes. Um, if you make a disclosure to your colleagues so that everybody knows and you say, you know, I, I, listen, I don't have to disclose this, but I want you to know, I do have this interest in this corporation and this will be benefited, possibly benefited by this. Um, and so I don't have to recuse myself, but I want you as my colleagues to know um, that I am making a disclosure about this. And that kind of a, of a statement, I think, would be powerful in the trial that we were talking about before. So um, at any rate, so it, it's, uh, it's kind of, this is sort of a downer hour for you all. I think when you <laughs> sit here, Hank goes through all the people who have been put in jail for a long time and I talk about it. And let me just end by saying, you know, I've represented a number of people and when Hank says a lot of my clients aren't known, um, the best thing we can do is get declinations, which is you go in front of the prosecutor and they decline to prosecute the case. Um, and when that happens, it, a lot of, frequently it doesn't even come out in the newspapers or other kinds of things. And, and um, so, so there are some, some good stories here, but I, I uh, understand if I were sitting there in your chair saying, oh man, this, this is a downer morning. But I, I, what I wanted to do was not say, don't steal, don't take bribes. Just say, you gotta recognize the slippery slope. If you're in a campaign, you just have to make the disclosures. It's always easier to do those things then than it is to go back. Thank you. Let me let's stay up here. Okay. So we have a few more minutes. Are, are there other questions here? I mean, I have uh, I have a final slide that uh, in terms of tips. And let's see if I can get it to come back up here. Oh, beyond my technical ability, maybe here. Well, I can give them to you orally. Three quick tips, um, and it's a variation of what Doug said about uh, getting lawyers' advice. I would say when you're faced with an ethical dilemma and you have the time, get an expert's advice. I mean, almost all states have some sort of ethics uh, commission, and if you have the time, you can submit the specific matter and get the imprimatur of somebody who can bless what you're intending to do and may even avoid having to make a... Uh, a public disclosure or even a disclosure on the floor if you've got somebody in an independent, uh, nonpartisan position who can say what you are about to do is appropriate, is, is permissible. Um, I'm not going to try and advertise for lawyers, but in this case, in this type of situation, it actually might make real good sense to get at least one lawyer's opinion. Going and shopping for lawyers' opinions is a whole other matter, but the, here's the reason why. As a legislator, as a business person, if you go and talk to a lawyer seeking legal advice, that is a confidential communication. And you are able to candidly and fully disclose to the person all of the issues that you're trying to put together in making a decision about what's the right thing to do. You can get somebody who's expert in disclosure law, in ethics law, and get somebody who can actually give you something that you can take to the bank. From a legal standpoint, in the court of public opinion, that will serve you well. Even if the decision that is made ultimately turns out to be challenged, you're going to be able to say, I didn't do this, this with me and my staff. I went and got an independent person that told me this was an appropriate course of action. In a court of law, uh, I can tell you that there's a defense uh, to any criminal charge uh, that's advice, uh, reliance on the advice of counsel. If you go to a lawyer, and you say, this is what I intend to do, and you fully disclose all the facts to that lawyer, and that lawyer says, it's okay to do it, I don't think there's a federal prosecutor or a state prosecutor in the country that will bring a charge against you. They'd have to charge the lawyer as well. Um, so it's, it's smart. It's smart to go and get somebody else to give you some advice. Willful blindness. How many of you recognize that term? I asked that to law students, and I'm glad that they're raising their hand because that's something that we're talking a lot about these days. You can't be charged with a crime unless you knowingly and intentionally commit the act. We don't prosecute people for negligence or mistakes, for accidents. But the law has changed, particularly in the last 15 years. And it started with Enron, but it is now morphing all over the place. Willful blindness is what led the Penn State uh, athletic director and president to get charged. Facts were brought to their attention. 
they were in a position to do something about it. They had the responsibility of the people underneath them to do something about it, and they were willfully blind to it. They turned aside. They didn't want to know about it. The Catholic Church, that's the issue right now, not only in this archdiocese, but throughout the country. Did leaders learn about abuse of vulnerable people and not act upon it? not do what they had the responsibility to do. Willful blindness is an instruction that the court tells the jury, normally you need to prove knowing and intentional conduct, but if someone was in a position of responsibility and had the ability to do something about it and deliberately turned away, deliberately remained ignorant, saying, I don't want to know about it, don't tell me the details. Plausible deniability, I think, was the term they used in Watergate. Don't let me know. That stays on your desk, and you can be held criminally responsible for that down the road, even if you never signed the false document or never made the false statement. If you allowed it to go on by people that were reporting to you, you can be held to own it. And here's the third and final point, and this applies to all of us every day. Good faith cures everything, certainly in a criminal court of law, but more importantly in our daily lives, in the, the, the court of public opinion. If you act in good faith, you are going to stay out of trouble. Now, business students will typically say, I don't know what that means. Give me something that I can hang my hat on that will keep me out of trouble from what happened to these offenders that you bring and have us tell their stories. And I say, all right, well, in my generation, it was called the newspaper test, but for your generation, it's the internet test. Every single one of us today, and certainly throughout this month, are going to have little issues that crop up in our personal relationships, in our business relationships, about taking one of two courses of action, disclosing something or not, owning up to something or not. It happens all the time. When you're faced with that, particularly in an official capacity, and you have a tough choice to make, if whatever decision you make and the reasons for it is on the internet the next day, can you live with that? People may disagree with the course that you took, but with whatever tough ethical call you make is transparently communicated to others, and you can stand up and say, I did it, I did it for this reason, and I believed it was the right thing to do, 99.9% .9 of the time, you will not find yourself in trouble. It's a test I think we all can benefit from, not just the people in office. Ma'am? Well, I, actually, I, 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 would, I would turn to Doug. I think he's more experienced, and I'd be happy to talk to you more at the break okay, about it, but I'd Doug? I'd just like to know what, what grounds do I have as a member of that committee, or is it just within legislatures? Is that where my, I'm limited to action at that point? I think that a um, couple of things here. Number one, it's factually based. Um, and so if there is a, a violation that comes up and it's easily proven. I think the Ethics Committee goes ahead and does its, its thing. Now, sometimes the prosecutors who will have a separate, let's say that's something bad, um, a lot of times then the prosecutors may even say to the state legislature, let us go forward with our prosecution and you figure out what's happening afterwards. And if somebody's convicted, um, then obviously you go, you sanction them, uh, censure them or whatever. And even as in one of the example that Hank did, um, you go forward, um, and uh, if he's acquitted, but you say, all right, it wasn't illegal, but it was unethical, and that's not behavior we do. Um, and so, and the, the interesting part of that is what I was saying earlier about what, what statements do, does a candidate make? You know, I'd say to a candidate, tell me what your priorities are. Is Number one, is your priority stay out of jail? 
then don't appear in front of the Ethics Committee and go under oath and talk about this right now until we figure out exactly what you're going to do. So, so there is this hard balancing point. I've seen people go early, and I've seen them wait till after the prosecution. Yeah, if it's a really complicated financial thing, you know, then ethics committees are probably better off to say, hey, let me, let me step back and, and let's let the prosecutors do their deal. If it's something that's much more simple, that seems easily provable, then, you know, that's a different standard, I think. Tom, do you have a point? Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, David Johnson from um, the Iowa Senate. What happened in our case there, Representative, was the FEC was already investigating the state senator uh, for a very complicated situation in the presidential campaign. Then a senator brought that up, filed a complaint with the ethics committee, and it was all about the rules. And one of our rules is you can't accept uh, payment from a presidential campaign, money campaign, as you're in office. You cannot be a paid staffer for a presidential campaign. And that's what it all revolves around. So that was the bot that was the vote there was whether he had broken the senator. And it was the senator who filed the complaint to the ethics. Right. But it was right. after the, the Federal Election Commission was already investigating the candidates involved because they were in time to work with Bill they were trying to That's well, right, that's right. It's, it is a rule versus criminal prosecution. Well, So, so here's my take on that is that typically if something pops up, you will have the opportunity and the reporters will say you get a few sentences. So the first one will say, you know, about to be indicted or something terrible is happening. And then you get to say something there um, off the, and, and frequently lawyers will make that statement and give a generalized denial that doesn't have a whole lot of specifics in it that just says, I'm sure that we'll be proven to be innocent later. You know, you've, you've all seen those statements come out. The, the hard thing is if you, when, typically when a candidate gets on, even if you have written out, here's the statement that you should make and that's all you should do and stop. As soon as the reporter starts asking questions, you wanna answer them and that's where it gets in trouble. That's, that's the issue. So we're gonna sort of try and stay on schedule here. So first of all, let's show our appreciation to Doug Kelly. Thank you. <laughs>